This time I hit the jackpot. Check out the DVD cassette I took the bid on for just 30 bucks. Today it's gonna catapult us straight into 4K gaming. As you can see, it's obviously a computer, but not a mini PC like you might think. It never marketed itself as one. See these special mounting holes? That's so you can hang it pretty much anywhere. And that's not a joke. In the wild, these things dangle in the most unpredictable places. ATMs, kiosks, digital signage. Or, in the totally legit scenario I just invented, as a TV box. Judging by the name, yeah, it's rocking an Intel CPU. Very powerful, mind you. So any 19 volt power brick will do. You can even hook up two monitors. Now that's what I call headroom. And hey, USB 3.0. But why the SS? Is it like better than the other two? And this looks like a mini jack for speakers. Up front, clearly nowhere near the last feature on this beast. A power button, a tape slot looking intake, and another SS USB port. Now that's power. You're probably wondering how heavy this power monster is. 546 grams. And that's with the case. Let's weigh it without. Amazingly, this bottom feeder is made of metal. This here is the so-called built-in display port, which means you can slap on a 7-inch screen and turn the thing into a handheld console. We've got built-in USB 2.0, two ports, and right next to them, USB 3.0. And this, chef's kiss, is a built-in power terminal block. Sadly, it doesn't match a regular brick, but as I discovered, the bottom two pins are plus, the top two are minus, and it can run off either 19 or 12 volts, so you can wire in a battery. This is a built-in COM port, and right next to it, a conveniently exposed M.2 slot for hooking up a gaming GPU so we can play at 4K resolution. If you really, really want, you could even add in a second gaming GPU, and I can see someone's already tried. And this prepare to be amazed, is a front panel header like on a desktop PC. See? Short the two pins, and it springs to life! So, how much does it weigh now? Let's check. 333 grams, which means the bottom alone weighs a glorious 213 grams. But hey, we can still pull the board out of the case. Dang it! Cursed screws! There are four of them. By the way, this little bracket turns out to secure the power brick cable. Come on, out of the case already. <sighs> finally. So, how much does the shell weigh? 93 grams. Which means the board with its cooler is only 238 grams. And, as you've guessed, our mighty computer doesn't need fans. It's passively cooled! That one slab can whisk away everything the CPU throws at it. Even better! The RAM is soldered on as four chips, and the storage is soldered too! But on the other side, here it is. Look how tiny that CPU is and imagine the power it allegedly contains. I won't even repaste it. We'll see what temps we get. I'll pop off the copper plate just to check how thick it is. Though all I really did was maul the thermal pads. Not exactly a gold mine for the scrapyard, eh? Alright, back on it goes. I'll leave the poor thing alone. Now let's reassemble it back to factory-ish condition and try to power it up. It needs a 5.5mm by 2.5mm barrel plug. Luckily, I've got a whole stash. Riddle me this! Which DisplayPort monitor here actually works? I'm betting on this one. But after I hit the power button, the monitor wakes up only to say no signal! What the heck? Is it even alive? I tried another port and the monitor didn't react at all! So I went back to dancing around the first one, but this time I plugged the computer into a TV. And it worked! No OS though, and the BIOS was password locked. So I had to pull the jumper to reset it. Did that, chose the second option, and it very politely asked me to cut the power and move the jumper to pins 1 to 2. Which, as a law-abiding citizen, is exactly what I did! Then I grabbed the lightest Windows 10 ISO I could find, packed with the most viruses for extra flavor, and used Rufus to slap it onto a flash drive. Stuck the drive into our TV box and started mashing F2. Would you look at this fancy BIOS! Intel Celeron N3550 and four slots showing a whole one gigabyte each. What an absolute beast! Let's hurry up and install Windows before it burns the house down with all that power. Luckily, it's just as easy here as on a normal PC. After the install, I tried a regular monitor again, and suddenly it decided to work! You're probably curious about our beloved Inceleron N3350. 
a mighty two cores and a blistering 2.3 gigahertz on both. Wow, check out that performance! 312 points, almost twice as slow as a 2008 Core 2 Duo on LGA 775, which is, you know, 17 years old. On the bright side, it sips under 7 watts, and temps don't climb past 55 degrees Celsius even without a fan. As for the RAM, only God knows how many channels it has. I'm guessing at least four. I mean, clearly all four slots are stuffed, despite every last chip being soldered. I couldn't wait to test the speeds. Turns out, I was wrong. It's dual channel. Probably the worst numbers I've ever seen! Now imagine how powerful the built-in Intel HD Graphics 500 must be with memory like that. Hold up! The memory type says DDR4, but SPD reports LPDDR3. So who's lying? I'd love to say the GPU is trying to look cooler than it is, but look, some basic counters like pixel fill rate and texture rate aren't even there, and the core and memory feel, well, numb. Maybe I should have downloaded Windows from Microsoft instead of some sketchy torrent. Things get even more interesting when I plugged in an external SSD with games. Over USB, its write speeds were way faster than the built-in 64 gigabytes this thing comes with. So yeah, putting the page file on the external SSD makes a lot more sense than using the native storage. This thing struggles to play YouTube in full HD, but we're not here to watch YouTube! Before I pick the right Pokémon for my collection for 4K gaming, I want to spin up a couple of classics to see what a GPU with 0 MHz on the core and memory can actually do. My beloved CS 1.6 runs surprisingly well, well, for the year it came out, but who in their right mind plays that at 1080p? Everybody knows the ancestors rocked it at 720p, and that was peak cool. Doesn't look much better though. Let's check it on CJ. Ooh, 40 to 50 frames per second. Wait, why is the CJ so skinny? Because I set the resolution wrong. Much better. That's on low though. Crank everything to max and CJ suddenly has more polygons, but kiss your FPS goodbye. Half-Life 2. Now we're talking. Am I pushing my luck? You got a crowbar on you? Anyway, it's running great with headroom to spare. Then I tried another Gaben Classic, at 720p of course, and it's not so rosy. CPU pinned at 100%, FPS dipping under 25, so I dropped it to 480p. Now we're in business, a steady 40 to 60 frames per second. As you've probably noticed, we're not at 2.3 gigahertz like in the benchmark, because the GPU and CPU share one mighty 6 watt budget. To squeeze under that power limit, they both downclock. CPU to 1.5 gigahertz, GPU from 0 to negative 200. So heavier titles like Left 4 Dead and Fallout New Vegas are barely playable. Dang it! I should have stayed in Ukraine instead of heading to New Vegas. Anyway, damage done. Let's move to the good part. Hooking up a discrete GPU. I've got a whole flock of them lying around. And obviously, I picked the weakest GPU I own. Kidding. I'm too scared to hook up a 4090 to this thing. Plus, that M.2 slot turns out to be Gen 2, so slapping a chunky card on here is kind of pointless anyway. Fingers crossed nothing catches fire. Link to the adapter is in the video description. No, not this janky one. A proper one. This Frankenstein special is my own handiwork. So I'm starting with a true classic. The mighty for 2008 GTX 280 with an 8 plus 6 pin power setup. Time for this Intel NUC to weld a power its forefathers could only dream of. I hate moments like this, but cutting them out would be a crime against content. Unfortunately, our GTX 280 only has DVI, which meant dragging out a fossil of a monitor. And, shocker, it wasn't plug and play. No picture, the monitor won't even wake up! And listen to that blower figure eight itself. Sounds like it's about to yeet off the shroud. Honestly, it looks less like the fan failed and more like the GPU delaminated from the PCB. Plan B! A younger patient with display ports. Enter the 2013 Radeon HD 7970. It's definitely alive, but still no image on the ancient monitor. So I spawned a modern display, hooked it to both the GPU and the motherboard, and... Turns out the card won't output without drivers, even though the system sees it. I installed the drivers, which, by the way, AMD kept updating for this 2013 Radeon all the way to 2022, and BOOM! The card's fully recognized and pushing a signal. 
Now, let's compare the before and after. Before, zero megahertz on the GPU and memory. After, 925 megahertz core, 1375 megahertz memory, plus a generous three gigabytes of GDDR5, as you can see. Before we dive into the 4K tests, let me tell you about a very useful platform. Did you know you can now build apps without knowing a single line of code? This is Lovable, an AI-powered platform where you just chat with AI, describe your idea, and it instantly generates a working app or website. The code is real, editable, and you can tweak design or features in seconds right on the page. I type, make me a landing page with a sign-up form. In under a minute, I have a draft running. Want different colors or layouts? I just ask and chat or drag elements around. Need a backend? Lovable sets it up automatically. Building with the team? Share access and collaborate in real time. Ready to go live? Just hit publish and you'll get a link you can send to clients or friends. Millions of people are already using it because now anyone, not just developers, can turn ideas into real working apps. Lovable is great for prototypes, internal tools, and MVPs, and also for fully functional apps and websites. Try it yourself today at lovable.dev, and don't forget to use my code, WHATPCYT20, for 20% off. Link and code are in the description. Go build something amaze! The GPU's running at 4 out of 16 lanes on PCIe Gen 2. Back in the day, that was still enough for 4K. But that's 4K without recording through the GPU! I flipped on the recording overlay and the bandwidth crashed and burned. Turn it off and the FPS shoots to the moon. So, yeah, I'm filming gameplay with a camera. Reminder, this is 4K resolution! Obviously, an old title like this is a cakewalk for the card. Dropping the resolution changes basically nothing. Okay, our subway enjoyer just got a few more polygons. Good grief, this GPU was a real monster. It even runs Half-Life at 4K on just four lanes. My jaw actually dropped. 160 FPS in Portal 2! I almost started believing in this in Celeron. Right up until the game tried to render anything past the next room and the FPS got cut in half. Still, our Enceleron holds a comfy 60 frames per second. I'm more interested in heavier games, though. Fallout at 4K on Ultra? The CPU taps out. Barely 30 frames per second. Dropping to high nets. What, plus 5 FPS? I expected more from this Enceleron. I tried the first Bioshock in 4K Ultra and was genuinely surprised. No on-screen metrics, but it felt smooth. Then I fired up the much newer Bioshock Infinite, same release year as the GPU, in 4K, of course. With a decent CPU, we'd probably see about 30 frames per second, but since we've got an Enceleron, it's low settings for us. Your polygons don't scare this GPU. At best, you'll spook the processor. Still playable, as you can see. Meanwhile, the much older Left 4 Dead 2 2009 runs terribly on this CPU, as you can also see. But the point stands! We managed to play most games in 4K! And, taking on considerable risk, I even hooked up an RTX 4090 to this ATM. Where else are you seeing a combo like this? RTX 4090 pulling 600 watts and a Celeron sipping 6. Smash like if you enjoyed the video, and don't forget the links I left below. See you next time.